We are continuing our study in Revelation um, chapter 4. We'll see how far we get, potentially through 7. But beginning in Revelation chapter 4, and my apologies, we don't have any extra worksheets and stuff, but I think it'll be all right. Revelation chapter 4, and let's have a word of prayer before we begin. And Elijah, would you lead us in that, please? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and for the blessings you've provided us with. We thank you for this opportunity to study in your word. We pray that as we do, we will uh, seek to understand your word and apply it to our lives so that we can grow stronger as Christians. And we pray also that you be with us throughout the rest of this day and the rest of this service. And so in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, Revelation, of course, written to the seven churches of Asia. We've looked at those brief letters in chapters 2 and 3. And now we begin to get into, I don't know if it's proper to say, the meat of the letter. And to what we would describe as apocalyptic literature with all the signs and symbols and fascinating scenes and things. Um, this is something that I don't know about you, but I would like to have been able to visually see this and the amazing um, description that's given here to actually be able to see it as John did. No doubt he was uh, awed, overawed by the things that he saw here. But there's a message being given in this and we want to emphasize that the Lord used words to convey that message. He didn't preserve a painting, if you will, that would be copied and replicated and passed down through time, but he replicated this message. This message was given, and then it was copied, and it was copied again, and it passed down through the ages till we have it in our hands today. So this is a message that the Lord had for the seven churches, primarily for them, and secondarily for us, things that we can learn from it as well. So let's read now Revelation 4. Um, let's just read the whole chapter. Who wants to read that for us? Revelation 4, 1 through 11. Mike, go ahead. After these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, the throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds of peals and thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord, and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. Okay. So he opens up here in chapter 4, talking about this voice coming to him. Uh, this voice could be Christ who's speaking to him and telling him to come and to see and to, to look at the things, look at this vision to see that. Um, 
It talks about the fact that he's in the spirit, which simply means what? Yeah, at the beginning of the book, he talked about he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. It's the idea that he's receiving this vision. That's really all that it's referring to. So it's a vision given to him, of course, by God Almighty. And then the throne that is there. When you think of a throne, what do you think of? What is a throne? What's the purpose of a throne? What's seat for the king to sit on? Anything else? There's power. There's authority in here. Anything else? Um, in a monarchy, what does the monarch possess as far as... Okay, all power, right? Uh, now, there's constitutional monarchies, and we could break all that kind of stuff down, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about like the ancient monarchies, and a monarch is the individual sole ruler. And that individual sole ruler has what's called sovereignty. They have the right to command, to decide, to make laws, to repeal laws. They have the right to life and death. So this idea of one sitting on the throne is one who is a sovereign, who sits on that throne, who rules and reigns with absolute authority. Um, now, in the description of the one on the throne, what's interesting about that? What is the description? Verse 3. Jasper, okay, Jasper. Does anybody know what Jasper is? What it's thought to be? It's like, like a diamond. Okay, so think of a... Um, a rock that is clear that when cut a certain way is very beautiful. Right? That's the idea. Like jasper. So pure. And then sardius. Sardius stone. Anybody know what that looks like or what that is? What we might call that? Ruby. Ruby. It's red. Think of fire, think of judgment. So you have purity, holiness, judgment, fire, red here. And then it talks about this rainbow like what? Like an emerald. What's emerald? Green. And this is understood to be like grace or mercy that tempers that judgment that is there. What's interesting about this description. Anybody notice it? There's one who sits on the throne. What are the characters and attributes given or what are not given? What descriptions are not used to describe this one on the throne? Other than color, there's no detail. Okay, there's no detail? And I, I think you're on it, but let's let's be very specific. I think the, the idea that he's speaking up there is the fact that they're not a physical appearance that we're seeing, but the image of those things. It's like those things. This is what we're seeing. It's like God is light, so therefore we see light. Okay. We're, we are made in the image of God, right? But what does the Bible say about God? Spirit. He's not flesh and blood, right? There's no human attributes ascribed to God here. One thing is, He's far and above, but that's not how we're made in the image of God. It's not, you know, fingers, eyes, ears, nose. Now, at times it talks about the hand of God, the right hand of God, the eyes of God, you know, the ears of God, all those kinds of things. But we understand that those those are being given just to help us to understand a function, something that's happening with God. So here, as he's describing him, there's no human attribute given, just qualities or characteristics, if you will. 
Stephen, as you were mentioning about the emerald and mercy, the characteristic, you know, we know the rainbow, God established his covenant with his people, which also supports mercy, because from that point on, he was merciful to us. Right, exactly. There was mercy shown in the judgment of the flood in bringing Noah and his family through that. And so that rainbow was there, and it reminds us to this very day about God's mercy as well. So very good. So you have the one sitting on the throne who is God Almighty. You have the things that are described around the throne, verses 4 and following through the rest of the chapter. Uh, what do we have there in 4 verse 4? Twenty-four thrones of the elders. Why twenty-four? What might this represent? Possibly the tribes and the apostles. Tribes and apostles. Very good. Remember that so many numbers used throughout this book, and there are multiples of numbers, and there are duplicates of numbers, and divisions of numbers, and all kinds of things. And here, twenty-four is twelve plus twelve. Twelve being a divine number. You have the twelve tribes of Israel. You have the 12 apostles representing God and God's people, God's people from the Old Testament and God's people from the New Testament. It's just representative of both of those groups being around the throne of God, worshiping Him and praising Him. It would, of course, represent the faithful of God. Now, it says they have what? What are they wearing? White robes, which would indicate what? Purity. Holiness. They have to have that to be in God's presence. They could not be before Him without purity. Then, what do they have on their head? A crown of gold. And this is a Stephanos, a, a crown, a mark of royal and exalted rank. What? Why would we have crowns? Why would these individuals have crowns of royalty? What did Peter say? We're a chosen generation. We're heirs. What's that? Priests and kings. Priests and kings. We are a royal priesthood. Right? So that's what he's indicating or pointing toward here. Now question number five, or question one, I'm sorry, I'd asked out of verse five, of what Old Testament event does verse five remind you and then what does it mean about this scene that's before us here? From the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, voices. Exodus 1916. Moses. And who else is there? And where are they? Children. Exodus 19, Exodus 20. What's that? Children of Israel. Children of Israel. Where are they? Where? At Mount Sinai. And what's happening with that mountain? Constantly. That mountain is shaking, thundering, lightning, smoke pouring up out of that mountain because the presence of God was there. and What was God doing in Exodus 20 in particular? Speaking. He, remember, Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, when they were given, they were given by God directly to the people. It wasn't given through Moses to the people. It's after God gave them the Ten Commandments, remember, and the people said, we can't take this anymore. We don't want you, God, to speak to us directly. Get Moses to speak to us. And so that's how it went going forward. But God speaking from the mountain in Exodus 20. Thundering, lightning, smoke. Do what? It comes across as thunder, lightning, and smoke. It's, it's that power for us. Right. So what are we seeing here? So what does that mean about what John's describing? It's power. It's power. Not just, and it says in this verse, and voices. In so, voices. Yeah, so there's words. Exactly. Words coming out. Mike? 
What we see is God, the Almighty God, the same Jehovah God that gave a message to His people from Sinai, is the God that's giving a message to His people now. And the same God that fulfilled all those things that He talked about will fulfill everything He's talking about here. There's no doubt, there's no question, because He is the sovereign God of the universe sitting on His throne. Does that make sense? Any other thoughts there? So you've got the seven lamps of fire, talking about the seven spirits, really referring to the Holy Spirit. You have a sea of glass that is surrounding that throne, representing the transcendence of God, how God is above all, He's separate, He's exalted above all things. And then you have these four creatures. Now, various things here, and of course, throughout the rest of the book, there are similarities to what we might read in Ezekiel or what we might read in various Old Testament prophets and there are some dissimilarities. We're not going to chase every rabbit and do all the comparison and contrast and detail. If you want that, buy a commentary that's about 800 pages and go through that. We're not going to be doing that. We're going to just try to hit the highlights of here's what we have. So. You have these four living creatures in the midst and around the throne and next to God. And they have, they're full of eyes in front and back. Why would they be full of eyes? All seeing. All seeing. They, can, they see everything. They have a very clear view of what's happening. So you have one creature that's like a lion. What would be involved in being like a lion? These are similar to yeah, similar to Ezekiel. What's that? Faithfulness. Okay, there could be faithfulness in there. When you think of a lion, what are we? What's our nickname for a lion? Power, majesty, king. Power, majesty, king of the jungle. There's there's nobility. Lions are very often associated with kings, right? There's nobility within that power, bravery, boldness. Bold as a lion, right? When we talk about a cowardly lion, there's a paradox there. Well, they're not supposed to be coward. So bold, brave, noble, power. What about a calf? There's one like a calf. Sacrifice. Well, it could be sacrificed. There's something else here, though. Calf would be a beast of burden. We think of calf when we think of little, you know, little calf playing in the field, but that's not really the idea here. Think, think more of a cow, cattle that type of thing. So there's strength or a beast of burden. Then you have one that has a face like a man. What would that tell us? Intelligence. Intelligence, exactly. Smart, sharp, thinking. What about an eagle? Sovereignty. Could be sovereignty there. Speed, swift. And they have really good eyesight too, don't they? So yeah, swift, speed. Um, says that these creatures have six wings. Go ahead, Ron. The other thing about that to me was the you know, eagles have a unique perspective. They have a panoramic view. They're right. They're above all of it. Yes. Yes, very good. Exactly right. They they soar above it all. Right. So and they have six wings. Now, in the Old Testament. I believe it's the seraphim that are described as having six wings. So think of this as you know these amazing creatures being described, probably indicating here angelic beings that are described with these qualities and characteristics. But just like God on the throne is not a diamond, is not a ruby, is not an emerald. Those are characteristics. Here the angels are not necessarily, you know, a calf, a lion an eagle, things like that. It's just describing the characteristics of them. But these beings are there around and it says they have no rest. They are ever vigilant before the throne of God and in doing God's bidding here. All right, so verses 8 through 11, what's happening there? Yes? In Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 10, it mentions these exact creatures there, so you know, it's a reference to the Old Testament prophecy that was given. So that's the likeness of the face of each had a human face, 
four had the face of the line on the right side, the four had the face of the ox on the left side, and the four had the face of the eagle. And then it goes on to talk about the wings also. So the referencing directly back to the Old Testament. Well, it's using the same language. It's, it's not the fulfillment of that. That was in Ezekiel's time with the people of Israel. Right, and, but this is what we were talking about is understanding the Old Testament was the key to understanding what he was talking about in Revelation about what was to come. Well, there, there's some of that, but understanding this apocalyptic imagery that's being used, it's, it's not referring necessarily to the same things. Correct. But it, it's... It's giving a description that conveys a message that has a meaning behind it of God working these things out. Well, just like the thunder and the lightning. Right. To understand what was going on in Exodus to understand what's going on in Revelation. It helps to give us... Scene, right, right. It gives us insight into the general characteristic mm -hmm. of what's happening here. Yeah, exactly right. Do you have something else, Rick? Okay. All right, super. So, verses 8 through 11... What's being described here? Constant worship. Constant worship. Praise being given to God by the living creatures and by who else? Verse 10. Elders. Okay, the 24 elders. They cast their crowns before Him. And what are their crowns representative of? We talked about that they were you know, royalty, we're a royal priesthood, but... I always think of authority. I mean, so it's like they're laying down their authority to, their will to... to there's, there's an authority, a submission to God. That's what I was as well. Yeah. I, I sort of pictured it as their life on earth submitted, fully completed and finished. Right. How, how did they get their crown? Be faithful until death, and I will do what? Revelation 2.10. I'll give you the crown of life. Part of it is an indication our salvation is due to you, God. These, this, this is really of you. It's not like they had gone out and they had taken the crown from someone, you know, ancient rulers taking it from another ruler and putting it on their head. This is something that had been given to them, and they are casting it before the Lord, it's due to you, God, and all praise and honor and glory is due to you. Now, anything else through chapter 4? Uh, in verse 11, where the people are being praised, and he says, you, For you created all things, and by you they exist and were created. Only creationists are there. It's evolutionist. Yeah. Yeah. There's there is no there is no dead atheist. No. They don't exist. No. They do simply do not because even through the New Testament, when, yes. when Jesus talked about the creation, you have to understand Jesus Christ was a creationist. Hundred percent. We use those terms. Right. Those are striking to me. Yes. Yes. Good observation. All right, chapter 5. Chapter 5. Um, let's read this whole chapter. It's relatively short, 14 verses. Who will read Revelation 5 for us? And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold. The Lion of the tribe of Judah and the Root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, 
which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, and the numbers of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. All right. So first of all, one through seven, there's a scroll here that needs to be opened. And in question two, I had asked, what is on the scroll? What's the significance is there to it being written on the inside, on the back, and then also having seven seals? So let's break that down. What's on the scroll? The okay, words, the writing. And well, I, I was just going to say God's revelation is on the scroll. Okay. Okay, written on the inside, on the outside, it's full. Yes, exactly. It's full. It's complete. There's a totality of it here. And then it has seven seals on it. What's seven? What's it representing in this book? What's seven spirits? Fullness. Spiritual fullness. And it's it's like divine fullness. Kind of a combined thing. Seven days of creation, right? Those two thoughts go together because if revelation has been complete, fulfilled, and seven is perfection or completion, they're, they're going together. And that's a huge point because there's many religious thoughts that uh, and denominations and you name it, that there's continued revelation that God hasn't fully revealed His plan to mankind, which is refuted here in this one verse, let alone several other places in Scripture. Right, exactly. He has the totality of it. When it's sealed up, that means he's, he's got it finished. He's got it completed. Now, the question is, it comes up, is, well, we'll get there in just a minute. The scroll is in the right hand of God. What would it, what would be in the right, why would he specifically mention it's in the right hand of God? That's the strong hand. Strong hand, the hand of power. You go throughout the Bible talking about the right hand, the right hand of power. Jesus told the Jewish rulers, you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand, the power of God. And that sent them ballistic on him because they knew what he was saying. I, I am at the power of God, the authority of God, and fellowship with God on par with God. So it talks about this scroll and as we go through the book, of course, this is the idea of the plan of salvation, God's eternal plan. And the question comes up is who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? So what, what's in that question? Who, what are they looking for here, Todd? Well, I was just going to say Christ is because he lived a perfect life of obedience. Okay. He is. So what does that mean about everybody else? They're not worthy and also he's the fulfillment of 
fulfillment of all the things that are inside that scroll. Exactly. Zach, do you have something? I was going to say, Rhetoric, you asked what's in that question. It's a, it's a false question. It's no one. Even only Jesus. It's the same question of who, who can enter the Holy of Holies? Nobody. Not even the high priest, except for one day out of the year. So not even the high priest was worthy to enter the Holy of Holies with one exception. It's, it's a similar question. Who's worthy to open? No one is exempt. Right. And it's the question is asked to bring attention to highlight that fact no man is worthy to open this up to unlock the mystery of god if you will to open that up and to reveal it and to fulfill it to mankind steve isn't that somewhat important why he says no one mm -hmm. you know because christ is the only son of god he was unique as we know exactly exactly right so then it says, you have something? Yeah. And it goes on a little further here in the verse, but no one, is, no one that has lived is mentioned under the earth. No one in heaven, so no angel can do it either. Right, exactly. No being other than who here? Okay, the lamb. Wait, wait, no, not the lamb. But the lion, wait a second. We got the lamb, we got the lion. Todd mentioned a while ago Jesus Christ. Jesus is never mentioned in the book of Revelation. Jesus, right? But what do we have? It, here, here's the thing I want to get to. You know, we looked at the book of Revelation, and as we studied before, sometimes we, we get nervous about it. Well, here, when it talks about the land, then it talks about the line of the tribe of Judah, we instantly know exactly who he's describing here. Right? So, we can understand this book. We can understand that message, just as the people who originally received it understood this message. It may take a little bit of work, a little bit of thinking, and we may not get everything down. Well, in terms of Jesus... That was only his name while on this earth. Once we're in heaven, everything is his true persona. I mean, that was his true persona as well. I'm not saying that. Yes, but understood. once you're in the heavenly realm, the earthly things are done. They're mm -hmm. past. Right. His name doesn't need to be used. His earthly name does not need to be used in heaven. It wasn't his earthly name. It wasn't his name before he came. And when he returns. You, you have the description of how he truly is in heaven. So he's the lamb that is also the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. It gets very specific exactly who this one is. And he is there to unlock and unveil this. Now, when you think about this being the eternal plan of God, I think this is an important point. We're going to touch on it in the sermon this morning. But you read through this book and you understand, if I can get this word out correctly, the historicity of the book and what unfolded among men in ancient times. It's pointing out the fact that God's hand is guiding history. And it's leading to a point. History in what's unfolded is not just a bunch of random circumstances. It's God's hand working in among mankind to bring something about. And it's headed somewhere. So the Lord is there to open up the seals to reveal these things. Um, and then, jumping on down now, let's jump a little bit further, verses 8 through 11, when the Lamb comes forward, He had took the scroll, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, they fall down before the Lamb, they have a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are what? Prayers of the saints. What's the harp? Yeah. 
He tells us exactly what the golden bowls are. Okay. Is is this is this where we would read and say it's okay to, to have a heart? Right? Because people do that. People people will say, well, there's a harp here in Revelation, there's a harp in heaven, and they're praising God on the harp, and so it, it's okay there, it's okay here. Yeah, we should all burn incense then, too. We should burn incense, too, right? right? But everybody except the Catholics and a few others, they reject the idea of burning incense. I guess I always thought that the two together were the prayer incense, the harp and the incense. No, the, the incense were very often associated with prayers going up before God. Well, when we are singing and praising, our instrument is our heart. It's yes. to be from our heart. These, these are representing praise and prayer. Yeah. Yes. And as Rick said, you, we read the praise that's being given here and the song that's being sung as it follows on with you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals. You know, you've redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, nation, people, tongue. All those things you made us kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. So there's, when you, when you are a child of God, you are sharing in his reign as Lord of lords and King of kings. In verse 11 then, heard the voice and the angels with the living creatures. How many angels are there? <laughs> 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. And again, the number 10 being a complete number, you know, 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 again, times that again, and then more and more on top of that. It's just saying there's an innumerable host around the throne of God here giving praise to the Lamb and giving praise to God the Father. So when you read in this, and we won't go through all those details in that, but when you read chapter 4, and the Almighty receives praise on the throne, and here in chapter 5, the praise that's given to the Lamb, and you see both of them have blessing and honor and glory and power, what does it tell us about God the Father and the Lamb? The Almighty and the Lamb. If they're both receiving the same praise from the same creatures, what does it tell us about them? Deity. They have the same nature, worthy of the same praise. Now, we'll pause just a second here and think about the fact this letter is being written to Christians in the first century who are feeling the persecution of the Roman Empire you have a ruler, Caesar, sitting on the throne who, from man's perspective, is the most powerful one on the planet and has these armies and has this power through both armies and through religion to bring great pain and suffering on the saints of God. But what's the message being given to them here? God is greater. He is preeminent. You may, you may have Caesar who's in a position of power on earth, but God Almighty is still sitting on His throne in heaven. And no one is ever going to change that. It doesn't matter what Caesar does, how many legions he has, there is God Almighty sitting on His throne. He's still ruling and reigning and still active in this world. So have faith. All right, so chapter 6, chapter 6. Let's read uh, 1 through 8 here as we talk about some people's favorite part here. Chapter 6, Revelation 6, 1 through 8. Who will get that? Andrew. Now I saw when the lamp opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, with a voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, he who sat on it had a bow. The crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard a second living creature say, Come and see. 
another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a red sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, do not harm the oil and wine. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill the sword, hunger, or death, and by the beast of the earth. Okay. All right, so the four horsemen of the apocalypse here. Great description. Uh, that's being given a picture that's being painted for us, if you will. Now let's remind ourselves, he's writing a letter, sending a message to people in the first century. Not the 21st century, it's the first century. Primary application to those individuals, those who live shortly thereafter, because he talks about the beginning of the letter, things which must shortly take place. So keeping it in that context, let's look at these. Talks about the, the four horsemen. Now, in verse 1, where it talks about, you know, a voice like thunder saying, come and see. In the English Standard Version, it just has come. So it's either saying to John, come and see, or it's calling out to the horsemen to come forth. I would lean toward that second one. Come. And the horsemen going out. And John is witnessing what's happening. So there's a white horse. The one who sat on it had a bow. And a crown was given to him. And went out conquering it to conquer. Now, there are some who see in this. And previously, I... I held this view of this, talking about that this is Christ, he's going out, he's in white, he's holy, he's on a white horse, he's going out and conquering with the gospel, things like that. So that, that is one idea of what's happening here. But in studying for this again, I ran across, across a reference that talked about that this is a description of a Parthian general. It would be a, the Parthians were nemesis of the Roman Empire. And in the east, which these people would have been right there at the doorstep of the Parthian Empire, that the Parthians fought the Romans and won quite a few victories against them. The Romans generally ran over anybody in their way. But the Parthians put up very stout resistance to them and won many battles and wars with them to where Rome had to compromise. And this really is better fitting with the description and going along with these other horsemen and what happens with them. If you think about it as a Parthian general who has a bow and that's what they would use as bows on their horses, and going out and he has this crown as he's conquering territory. And so it's conquering the idea of this power will rise up against Rome and defeat them and start knocking them down and causing them problems along the way. And we know Rome eventually falls apart. They have outside forces coming and attacking and destroying them. Now part of it's because of internal decay, but these outside pressures came upon them. But this crown is a victory crown. And so you think about that, this outside general, his power, his forces coming in, attacking Rome, conquering and to conquer. And then in verse three and four, you have the red horse, which is Indicative of what? 
war, right? This war that's coming upon them. And there's death and there's enslavement that follows war. The ancient wars, pretty much any time one person conquered another, if they had to fight for it, they would take the entire population and sell them off into slavery. So there's death, there's enslavement, they take peace from among men, there's that idea of man turning on man. They had a great sword, this description here of this great sword is the Roman gladius, and it's the idea they're going into slaughtering. They're slaughtering people as they go. Now, the black horse, and we'll just briefly finish out these four horsemen, I think we have to stop there, but the black horse, what's black indicative of? Death. Death. Mourning, right? Because of the hardships and things. But then what happens? What does it describe there that this rider had? He sat on it. What did he have in his hand? Okay, scales. What would the scales be? In question number three, okay, I know it was awkward, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but you've got wheat and you've got barley. What's the difference between wheat and barley? Yes, one is more expensive as it describes here. Which one? Okay, but which one's more expensive? The wheat is more expensive. Why? What's more expensive? Hamburger or filet mignon? Why? It's better, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's a prime. So wheat is more expensive because it's the better grain. It's the better food to make things with. Barley was the cheaper stuff. And so it's just simply saying you, you've got one that's more expensive than the other, so one denarius for a quart of wheat, three uh, quarts of barley for the same price, and then how much is a denarius? Day's wage. How much would a quart of wheat feed? Does anybody know that? Okay, I wouldn't have known it either. One person for one day. So what would we call this? Do what? A day's wage. Well, there's a day's wage. It would be subsistence living. You barely get by from one day to the next. Now, if a man is working and he can provide one person one enough food for one day, what about his family? What is this telling you about the people? They're struggling. They're starving. So, and you think about ancient war, when it came through a place, they would destroy crops or the crops could not be planted or they could not be harvested because the armies are moving through and famine often followed war. Very often. And that's what it's talking about here. You have this war that's coming in, this conquering that's going on, and then as a result of that, you have this inflation because there's not enough food, and so the prices go through the roof. The poor people are struggling to get by. Christians being caught up in this. The wine and the oil are not touched. What are wine and oil compared to wheat and barley? Luxuries. Luxuries. Wealthy people, it doesn't affect them as much, right? Just like in our society, when things turn bad, it's the guy who earns an hourly wage that has a tough time getting by. The guy who's sitting on, you know, a billion dollars, it's not that big a deal. So what if the price of fuel triples? To him, it doesn't really matter. The guy working week to week, it matters. It hits him hard. So that's kind of the idea that's being presented to us here. Now, the fourth seal opened up. The pale horse comes out. What's pale represent here? What's, what's his name? Death. Only one of them that's named death. And Hades follows. Why are death and Hades together here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hand hand. So you see, you see how these four, we're given four horsemen, but they go together. 
You have one with a bow going out, conquering it to conquer. You have another one that is coming along and pushing war. So there's the conqueror, there's war that comes upon the land, there's death, destruction, starvation, famine that's coming along. And then you have death coming in, sweeping over the land, and Hades collecting the souls, right? Death is going along collecting those souls along the way. And as this is unfolding, not only is it happening in the empire, but it's happening to Christians. Christians being generally from among the poor, they're feeling the impact of these things unfolding. All right. Um, we just have to stop there. Went over just a little bit. So thank you for your patience. And Lord willing, we'll pick up there next week. We'll go on through chapter 7. Um, if you will go ahead and jump into 8 and 9, have that ready in case we move like lightning, symbolically.